Today we're going to start our discussion of electricity. And to begin, let's just quickly review some of the basic uh, properties that we all know about electrical charges. First of all, we know that there are two types of charges, positive and negative. And uh, we know that if I uh, charge up uh, a rod and transfer some charge to two pieces of aluminum that are tied by strings to the ceiling, uh, both of those pieces of aluminum, since they have the same uh, charge, are going to repel each other. There's going to be impulsive force pushing uh, this piece of aluminum to the left and this piece of aluminum to the right. Because like charges repel, I could do the same thing if these were positive charges. I charge them up with a positive charge. Again, we would get some repulsive uh, force between the two pieces of aluminum that are uh, pushing them off in different directions. Uh, similarly, if I were to charge one of the uh, pieces of aluminum with a positive charge and one piece with a negative charge, we would see that these two uh, objects would be attracted towards each other because opposite charges attract. So this is the basic property of charges. We know that there is, as far as we can tell, there are two types of charge, which we have labeled as positive and negative. Like charges repel each other, and opposite charges attract. In addition to knowing that there are two types of charge, we also know that all matter is made of two fundamental charges. Uh, we have, uh, suppose we look at a hydrogen atom. We know that there is a proton at the nucleus and an electron traveling around the nucleus. nucleus. Uh, there may also be some neutrons which are neutrally charged uh, in the nucleus as well. Uh, but the charges of the proton and the electron uh, are given simply by uh, the same number, except the proton is positive and the electron is negative. Pro the proton gets a charge of 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. The electron gets a charge of negative 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Just how big is the force between charges? Well, uh, suppose we have two positive charges here. They're repelling each other. And the first positive charge has a charge Q1, and the second positive charge has a charge Q2. Well, we can write down the force between these two objects uh, using something called Coulomb's Law. So we can write this as the force of 2 on 1, and we'll write this as the force of 1 on 2. And by Newton's third law, these two forces have to be equal and opposite. So what exactly is that force going to look like? We're going to write that force between the two charges as it's a force, so it'll be a vector. Uh, and it will be bigger if the charges are bigger. So we're going to write this as charge 1 times charge 2. And it will be smaller if I move those charges far away from each other. So um, if, you, uh, if you're taking clothes out of the dryer on a dry uh, winter day, uh, you might notice that, um, you know, that the hair on your arm stands up a bit. Uh, the reason for that is there might be some static electricity uh, that gets generated. But if you go far away from the dryer, you're not going to be able to feel that static electricity. So the force between charges is distance dependent. Um, and in fact, it's going to be dependent uh, as a function of r as 1 over r squared. So as r gets bigger, the force is going to get smaller. Now, if I work out the units for this, you'll see we get coulombs, coulombs over meters squared. Uh, that doesn't quite give us the right units for force, um, so we're going to need to put a constant in here. I'll say what that is in just a second. Uh, that constant can be written in a few different ways. Uh, I'm going to write it this way. We're going to just call it k is 9.0 times 10 to the 9. And then I need to get 
newtons for the force. Uh, so that would be newtons times meters squared divided by coulombs squared, which will cancel out the coulomb squared on top and the meters squared on the bottom. Now it turns out there is another way to write this constant. We can say that k is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. Now, epsilon naught is another physical constant. Uh, epsilon naught, uh, this one has a name. This is 0.854 times 10 to the minus 12. Uh, and it gets units of Coulomb squared, second squared, uh, divided by kilograms meters cubed. Uh, this constant has a name. This is called the permittivity of free space. Right down here. Permittivity of free space. As we'll discuss uh, in a few lectures, the permittivity of free space tells you uh, how likely free space is. Free space is just a vacuum. How likely free space is to generate an electric field. So what we have here is, uh, skipping electric fields for now, what we have here is a force law. It's a fundamental force law that tells us the force between two different charges. So if you have two charges, we can figure out how much they're going to be pressing on each other. How can we actually measure Coulomb's law to test whether or not it actually works? Well, it's a fairly uh, simple experiment to do, actually. Uh, you can take a couple of pieces of aluminum or rubber balloons or what have you, uh, something that you can transfer a charge to, and you charge them up, and then you set them up like this where they're tied to the ceiling. So let's just say these are a couple of balloons. These look a little bit more like balloons. They're tied to the ceiling. We take some fur and we rub it on the balloon, or maybe we rub it on our heads, uh, like you maybe did at a, at a kid's party when you were little. Uh, and we know the balloons will repel each other. So we can look at the electric force that gets generated, because there's going to be two electric forces pushing uh, the balloons apart. So let's, uh, let's see what other forces are in here. Well, there's the force of gravity that wants to pull the balloon down. And there's also a force of tension pulling the balloon up uh, and to the left, trying to force it back to where it was before. So we've got these three forces on it. And we can use the gravitational force and the force of tension to figure out how big the electric force is. All we have to do, just like we've done for a long time now, is we've drawn our picture, we define a coordinate system, make a free body diagram. Now we just have to sum up the forces in each direction. So if I sum up the forces in the x direction, I'm going to get an electric force pushing in the positive x direction. And I'm also going to get a component of tension. So what I can do is say there's an x component of tension and a y component of tension. And as we've done many times, we'll just look, I'm going to Use SOHCAHTOA for that angle there. That's just the angle measured uh, that tells you how far the string is stretched to the side as the electric force pulls the balloon. So that's going to be, it looks like, a uh, negative force of tension. And it would be in the x direction, so that's going to be the opposite side. So that would be a sine of theta. And we know that the sum of forces in the x direction has to be zero because this is a static situation. The balloons are just repelling each other. And then they're just sitting there. So we'll say that this is the force of 
uh, the electric force has to be, since this whole thing has to be zero, we can say that the electric force is equal to the force of tension times the sine of theta. So it's easy enough to measure the angle of theta. All I have to do is figure out the force of tension, and I would know the force, uh, the electric force. So this gives us a way to measure it, provided I can figure out what the force of tension is, because I know what theta is. Well, it turns out the force of tension is fairly easy to figure out as well. All I have to do to get the force of tension is sum the forces in the y direction. Uh, because in the y direction, I'm going to have the y component of tension, which will just be the force of tension times now, instead of the sine, it would be the cosine of theta. And I would have minus the force of gravity, which is easy enough to measure because that's just minus the mass times g. And again, this would have to be zero. So we can solve for the force of tension. Just move fg and cosine theta over to the other side and you'll find that the force of tension equals the force of gravity, which is mg, divided by cosine theta. So all we have to do, all we have to do is measure the mass of the balloon, the angle that the balloon gets pushed out by, and we can figure out the electric force. So this gives us a way to test Coulomb's law. And when we test it, it turns out we just get the same formula we got before. It's going to be K, charge 1, charge 2, divided by R squared. We can do simple experiments like charging up balloons and measuring the force on them uh, to determine the force law and to show that Coulomb's law um, is in fact correct. Um, and all the experiments that we can do on a variety of different size scales seems to show that this law works uh, for everything uh, down to atoms and all the way up to galaxies and solar systems. So uh, if that's the case, we could actually use Coulomb's law to figure out other interesting things, different properties of atoms and other uh, interesting physical systems. So let's take a look at a hydrogen atom. Let's uh, just try to imagine that the electron going around the proton is kind of like the Earth going around the sun. It's just going in orbit around uh, the, uh, the nucleus of the atom. Well, if that's a, a decent model, we can figure out the force with which the proton pulls on the electron, and vice versa, since we have Newton's third law here. Uh, but the force on the electron, again, is just going to be K times charge 1, this would be the charge of the proton, times the charge of the electron, divided by R squared. Now, R squared uh, is going to be the radius of the atom. And if you measure the radius of the atom, it turns out it will be about 10 to the minus 10 meters. Or, uh, we have a name for that, it's called an angstrom. We'll say 10 to the minus 10 meters to stay in standard units. Uh, we're going to take K, which we said was 9.0 uh, times 10 to the 9 Newton meters squared for Coulomb squared, uh, times the charge of the proton, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 Coulombs, times the charge of the electron, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 Coulombs, negative, divided by R squared. So that's going to be 10 to the minus 10 meters, whole thing squared. And uh, we can already see that the units are going to work out correctly, because I've got meters squared down here, meters squared up there. Coulomb squared, Coulombs, Coulombs over here. So we're just going to be left with Newtons. And if I multiply all of these together, you will get negative 2.3 times 10 to the minus 8 negative. Newtons. Now that seems like it's a small force, and it is, but remember that it's acting on something as tiny as an electron. So a small force on a very uh, tiny object can have a big effect. Um, so even though this is a small number, 
It's a fairly decent sized force, um, considering that the electron is so tiny. Now it turns out we can do more than just figure out the force on the atom. We can also figure out how fast it's going. Because this electric force, according to our very simplified model of the atom where the electron is just going around in an orbit. Uh, but if that's the case, there's another name for this uh, force when it does this, uh, causes this type of motion. Because it's undergoing uniform circular motion, which means that this would be a centripetal force. Which would mean that my electric force, kq1, q2 over r squared, could be written as a centripetal force, which we write as mv squared over r. But this gives us a way to relate the speed of the electron to the force that it feels. So we can figure out a lot of very useful information this way about the atom. Its speed, its force, uh, potentially its mass. Um, I'll leave this as uh, an at-home exercise. Uh, but Coulomb's law, because it's a fundamental physical law, has opened up a lot of doors for us. Today we're going to begin discussing...